Can I help you, sir? <clears throat> yeah, what, what the hell are these? These are tortillas. Tortillas deliciosas. Yeah, so what, what are these? These are tortillas, which contain Echo Bright's tax records and other documents showing how your company has created invoices with fake charges. How did you get these? I'm sorry, but Chef never reveals his recipes. <laughs> you, do you know how fucked you are? I'm gonna have this place closed by the morning, do you understand? Oh, no, that won't be necessary. Hello, listening people. Hello, sorry. Oh, hello, gosh. hello, hello. Hello, chef, how are you? Oh, hello, hello. Oh, Bartek, stop it, stop it. Sorry, We're Ryan. Scared. We're scared already for the... Oh, for the event we're going to go through today. No, it's not a televisual event. It's actually a spooky month event in which we talk about movies that are particularly spooky. I'm Ryan, and over there, the man who won't stop clapping. I have stopped clapping because it hurts. Now. He's on the inside, he's clapping. <laughs> but that's Bartek over there, and we mm -hmm. are spit and Polish, and we are both spitting young gentlemen who happen to be Polish, and Bartek... I think I ask this every year, but what are some spooky things that the Polish culture loves to do? What is the thing that Poland uh, finds to be spooky scary? Uh, not being racist. That's scary and sexist. Don't forget that part too. <laughs> yeah, look, I I don't think they do Halloween. Do they not have folklore? Do they not have well, things of that nature? Probably not Halloween. I'm not say I didn't say that though, did I? I didn't say Halloween. I said folklore. Do the, do Polish people not have spooky, scary, grim folklore things? Like, is there nothing in the Polish country and culture that is kind of like eerie or spooky on a like cultural level or like folk tale level? Maybe, but I certainly didn't grow up knowing any of it. Bartek, what is the cultural stuff you do know? What's the one I remember you splash water on each other? <laughs> that's pretty spooky. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, that's Easter. Yeah, and that's a cultural thing Poland does, right? Mm -hmm. What is it again? Explain for the listening people who aren't abreast of the Polish tradition of spritzing each other with water so for Easter. For those of you that are not a tit of the situation, um... On the day after Easter Sunday, which is Easter Monday, um, we have a thing called Schmingus Dingus, which, <laughs> which, as you can tell from the little giggle there, Ryan is for some reason a fan of the name. I, I personally don't get it. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> they should call it Schmingus Dingus Zniknonch, and then Ryan's like, "That's the best thing ever." It's too powerful. Yeah, um, I'm not sure the reason behind it or the origins, but basically, you squirt each other with water and say Schmingus Dingus. Now, before the last episode of this month. I need you to come back with answers about what Poland finds to be scary and spooky and, like, does it have any kind of uh, traditions or creatures or things of that nature in its, in its history that kind of linger in that way? I want you to come back. This is homework for you to do because... We are always the, like in the top 10 Polish podcasts and in the top 10 men podcasts as can, well. Can I just say Nazis and concentration camps? I knew you were <laughs> going to say that. That's different, though. That scares everyone, as it should. Uh, but we are here today to talk about a movie that came recommended from the listening people because we have a cycle of recommendations. Each week we go through someone's pick the first week of it is Bartek, then the second is mine, and then the third week is the listening people, and then we go back to Bartek. And we have hit upon the listening people, and it's someone or someones important to us both, Bartek. Some, some too. Who were the people that recommended the film, and what film did they present to us? So this one was a dual recommendation, because when I was asking them for recommendations, one of them said, and the other said, oh yeah, I second that. Um... And they're two people who I think we've done a recommendation from recently. Uh, they are my friends Amanda and Stefan. Are they are they together as a couple? No, no. Are they they're, just friends? They're friends. They've been friends since primary school. Here's the fun thing. Until now, I just assumed that they were a couple because they're always recommending things in unison <laughs> together. And I'm always imagining them linked arm in arm, skipping to the cinema to see the newest <laughs> horror film. 
because they recommended a lot of horror films, a lot of newer horror films, and the one they gave us today was, which was it again? It was a good friend, uh, Amanda and Stefan, they went to go see, I guess, did they tell you their history with this? Um, did they see this in the cinema? I didn't ask for their history, no, I think, I can't remember which one said it first, but yeah, it was just the thing, they both liked the film and they thought it would be yeah, a good recommendation. And the film is The Menu, starring Rafe Fiennes, Nicholas Holt, Anya Taylor-Joy, John Leguizamo's here, there's there's a few other faces, more character actors, but those are the big, the big ones, am I missing any of the big ones? I think those are the big stars and the rest of them are like fun character actor folks that you may know from tv shows mainly or uh, certain films oh there's um what's her name hong oh yes yes she's an up-and-coming actress too like she's been around for a while but she's uh i've heard her name she's been in a bunch of stuff like she was in the whale starring uh brendan fraser that won an oscar and She's yeah, she's been around a bit. What's her name? It is Hong Chao. Is Hong it? Chao, yes, Hong Chao, and yes, she's definitely one that's coming up in a lot more things recently. She was in that Watchmen television show. I saw her in Kinds of Kindness earlier this year. She was in Asteroid City, the Wes Anderson movie. She's in Poker Face, that TV show. She appeared in an episode. So yes, she's she's one that's like she's been around for a while, but she's getting on the radar more and more with projects like this. And how would you describe the menu to people? Uh, the menu is a, a satirical sort of black comedy about a group of uh, wealthy people who have paid to go to this island that a famous chef lives and works on, um, and they're going to be given a you know high class dining experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but then. Uh, as it goes on, things start to go a little bit wrong, and then they become very wrong. Things become very wrong. We are following the point of view of a young woman, Margot, who was not on the guest list. She's a last-minute addition, and from the beginning, that's a problem. Yeah. And everything goes from there. We won't get into too much else detail-wise, but yes, this is a black comedy satirical film first, horror film second. At least that's my reaction to the movie. No, I agree. I agree. I think it balances those things well, but I think it is very much a comedy through and through, uh, and social commentary, of course. Uh, there's a, this is a uh, eat the rich type of movie. It's very in vogue currently to have these type of films in which it's got these elite actors, top of their game, making fun of rich people and maybe a bit of the image that they have themselves. Like Rafe Fiennes is the chef in question, the man in charge. And when you think of Rafe Fiennes outside of Harry Potter, say, you th- I-, I at least think of him as a very classy gentleman, someone mm. with a very prim, proper aesthetic to him, a very clipped manner of speech, someone with he was in, the hair slicked back, you know. He, he was, was in The Real The Avengers. Oh, of course, yeah, but that's exactly, you. We, that's, that's true, and there may be a bit of levity to that, but he is like the English gentleman in that movie. And I always think of him in more recent fare for uh, Grand Budapest Hotel. Absolutely. In which he's the embodiment of class, even though his character can be very unclassy in that movie because things are going wrong. Having someone like him be this deranged, not quite right chef is is kind of perfect. And the movie very much plays with that overall. So people, give the menu a watch for yourselves if you do not want to be spoiled on the details of it. Because I say that this is one in which that base premise, it's a good hook, but the way things unfold and there's certain twists and turns. And I don't even want to give away the type of humor that this movie has for mm. you because it's a, it's a very interesting type of humor that it it unfolds in front of you as well. Like there's, you know how we always talk about like how the narrative unfolds, the humor also unfolds. Yeah. This is the type of film just to get right into it where, um, you know, I've been aware of the premise for a while and I've heard, you know, some responses to it. Um, and even like the ironic aspect of like, oh, it's making fun of the rich, but the people in it are mm-hmm. also very rich. 
Um, but I didn't actually know the finer details of like how things play out. Like I didn't know uh, if it was like a literal play on like eating them or mm. if it was, you know, a, a whole thing of, you know, just making fun of them. I didn't know, you know, how dark the film would get. Oh, yes. Um, the menu, the titular menu and how that is actually a structure of how the story is told is fun. Yeah, well. yeah. The, the way that the story unfolds, because you have this one character who at the beginning of the film uh, seems to be the main character because mm-hmm. the, you know, the actual main character and this guy are, uh, seem to be a couple. Yes. Um, or at least friends. Or at least friends. So some sort of close relationship. Um which, you know, is a bit strained, as we find out. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a bit. Um, and that male character is very invested in the whole situation, and very early on, he's trying to basically pick at the real meaning behind everything, you know, even before it goes wrong. And it gets your mind thinking about, you know, oh, okay, so what's what's the real truth behind everything? There's a great dynamic between these two leads because he's the one that knows everything and she's the audience surrogate character. So he's the one that provides handy exposition for the characters we're meeting, the uh, the environment, the world. He's the one that's going to ask questions to the chef and to his colleagues while Margot, she's asking questions that we, the audience, would be asking more so, like, how come this, how come that? And she's also kind of like an empathy point as well, where she's like looking at things from a much more humanistic level while he is looking at them from what you would just from script wise, a lot more of like a structural plot level. Like he provides that. And it's actually like an interesting dynamic just from a purely script point of view. Then things go off the deep end in a magnificent way with that duo. But yeah, (laughs) everyone, please check out the menu. I saw this in the cinema when it first came out. I went on a triple movie date night, and what a film fest it was for me in a weird way. We started out with Triangle of Sadness, which is a very much a eat the rich type movie about a bunch of rich assholes stuck on a yacht. Yeah, yeah. you know um, what? I think I'd heard the premise of that one as well, and I thought that this one was mm-hmm. the film that's on a boat. And when they get on the boat at the beginning, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've mm. heard bits of this. Triangle of Sadness, I, I mix bag on. Incredible performances and, you know, not to get too much into the weeds of that, but one of the saddest pieces of information about that movie was the the lead actress of that movie, you know, who's young and not passed away shortly after the film was made because she had, like, a long-term health problem from, like, a car accident years earlier. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated to find that out because I was like, this actress, she carried the movie for me. And I was like, I can't wait to see... Oh, oh, there's no more, you know, sadly. And then we watched The Menu. That was in the middle. And it was a packed cinema. Very much people were aware that they were getting in for a funny affair. I didn't really know. I knew the basic premise. I saw Rafe Fiennes was in it. I didn't even know what kind of accent he was going to do in this movie. I thought he was going to do his British accent. And then I was thrown for a loop that he's kind of doing an American accent. I'll just say it. I saw it in the cinema. I saw it last night. I don't think he sticks to that accent. I think <laughs> I think he's 90% British in this movie. Like Until he talks about where he grows up, he just sounds like Rafe Fiennes to me. I don't know if you have... A disagreeing, disagreeing opinion on that, but for me, ninety percent of the no, time, he, he, he just sounded like how he did in the Avengers. It, it, it added to his worldliness. There you go. It added to his worldliness. And then the final film I saw with my wife was Banshees of Inisherin, which is the Colin Farrell, uh, uh, Colin Farrell movie, where he and it's by the same guy who did In Bruges and yeah, I think Seven Psychopaths. That was the best one of the day. Yeah, I think amazing you, film. Either you or our friend Will recommended it to me. I recommend it. It's it's an amazing movie, and uh, it was great. It's funny. It's sad. The premise of that movie is one day his best friend just doesn't want to talk to him anymore. And it's and that's the star, That's the movie. Damn. And it's just an amazing film. That but would, that would fuck up their podcast. The menu was the one where it was in the middle, and it was in the middle for me. Mm. I thought it was fine. I enjoyed it. I gave it like three out of five stars. It was a fine piece of business. Great acting. Some of the humor didn't work for me, and there was a level of uh, oh, he's so clever. Like okay, pretty clever, and the disconnect of. For me, I have some problems with these let's skewer the rich socialites because 
and we talked about this in Bodies, 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 the previous recommendation from Amanda, mm -hmm. that sometimes there is this level of, do they know that they themselves, the people making this movie, are these people? And how genuine does that feel to you? There's There can be a dissonance sometimes when watching these pieces of media that are like, oh, the rich, have you ever noticed? But it's like, you, th there's, the best way to describe it is, the people online have made one critique of this movie that sticks in my head so vividly, which is Anya Taylor-Joy, the lead actress of this film. Mm -hmm. She's a very pretty lady. She looks rich, you know, like she looks like a rich person. Uh, she's a vegetarian or vegan her whole life. And people always bring up the fact of like, at the end of this movie, you can tell that this is a woman who's never eaten a cheeseburger in her fucking life. <laughs> and that critique kind of summed up how I felt about the menu when I saw it the first time. Of like, these are rich people making fun of rich people, and it feels like they've never been poor in their life. Like, they've <laughs> never been servers. And Will Ferrell and Adam McKay produced this movie. And I'm like, oh, sure. Like, I feel a bit differently to it now, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. I think it's shot well. I think it's acted great, but there was some humor to it that didn't work for me, and just that that thing in my brain where I'm like, ah, this just isn't hitting as a genuine thing for me. It feels yeah. just very clever. Like someone's pushing their glasses up on their nose and looking at you like, mm, did you see what I did there? Yeah, I did see what you did there. Yeah, normally I don't have that issue, but I think for this one, it was subconsciously on my mind for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also the another aspect that's kind of similar that we've talked about in the past. And I think we even mentioned it in Gozu when we did that two mm -hmm. weeks ago. Um, sometimes we watch a film and there's, you know, a certain level of, you could argue, pretentiousness. The pretentious threshold, I yeah. called it. Pretentiousness, uh, pretentiousness. Pretentiousness threshold. It's a hard one to say. I've, I've always been able to say that word fine, but I think just putting threshold after it is fucking me up. The pretentiousness threshold, um... <laughs> oh no, now I've almost forgotten my point. Uh, in, in this film, it is, on a, on a very big part, it is intentional. Yes. Um, but yeah, when you put in the meta layer of it, it's like, ooh, but is it? It's hard because all of the characters, except for Margot, are caricatures. Mm. They're very much two-dimensional. They are very overplayed of what they are. But there's a little bit of keep saying a little bit of dissonance there's just a little bit of you that goes the horrific situation they found themselves in you still wonder yeah but do they deserve such a horrific fate just because one of them went to brown university and doesn't have student loans anymore like that's i always point at that as the joke that maybe just doesn't land for me i've seen people online praise that joke love that joke maybe it's a very american joke as well i don't know about brown i don't know any about that but like the I think student that's a british university oh is it but uh i think emma watson went there but um but you know there's there's the joke of like oh she she's she she deserves it because she doesn't have student loans and like yeah but everything else we learned about this character doesn't seem like she's worthy of being fucking burned to death i mean uh, um, <laughs> Ray, i mean ray fine chef's character does have some you know petty reasoning yes. like even for the character that she's associated with he saw a movie of his that yeah. he really didn't like but but I, and that's where there's a lot to discuss because he brings it as a petty reason, but then he cuts to the core of the reasoning he's at for each one of them, which is, I saw an artist who had given up on their talents. And that's what Ray Fiennes feels like about himself. Mm. He's an artist that is wasting away and giving up his talents and just doing it for the sake of it. And he looks at John Leguizamo's character as a horrific version of that, and he must kill him now. Mm. His John Leguizamo's assistant, on the other hand, it is just a joke. Like, there is no deeper meaning. Yeah. And that's where it's like I a kind follow up. Of, it's like, well, what about me? Oh, yeah. this. And I think the film kind of vacillates between those two modes a lot. Like, it just kind of goes between those where it's like, oh, there's a really deeper point here. And then sometimes, mm, okay, a little, a little shaky for me in terms of like, am I willing to buy into these people getting murdered? Because that's the thing with a horror movie, you have that level to it where it's like, okay. I'm buying into these people are going to die and or they deserve to die. There are some horror movies where you watch them where you're like, well, they deserve to die, these people. Like, that's a part of the 
the thrill of it or like the fun of it and realizing why they need to die mm. or why this person is getting their revenge on them. And I think this movie tries its best to do that, but also there's that pretentiousness threshold where these are so caricature people that I kind of feel like, I don't know, man, do they do they really deserve it that much? But that's also kind of a part of the movie. It's it's this whole like conversation about like, well, you could have tried to escape harder. Did you what you you think about that? And they're like, hmm, hmm. Yeah, we'll think about that for the rest of the movie. Like, he brings it up, like, you ever thought about how you didn't try to escape harder than you have? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, we must die now. Um, he has a lot of really good lines, right, finds. <laughs> but talk to me more about your overall reaction and opinions on, on the menu. How did you go with this? You knew the basic premise of it, but how was the experience of watching? Well, you, you're bringing up just now, you know, the whole thing of like, do these people deserve to die? And for most of them, I honestly think it's a somewhat easy no, mm -hmm. because a lot of it is based on like personal feelings. It's like some of them have committed, you know, illegal acts and that's part of the you know, justification for why they're being terrorized here. But for a lot of them, it is just kind of personal stuff. Like we brought up with the the Brown University girl. It was, you know, basically kind of a joke. Um, with the actor, it's he hasn't actually done anything evil. It's just something that uh Ray Fiennes is projecting out of him onto himself. Again, Ray Fiennes is his character and he's like a cult leader. Yeah. And some of them, like with John Leguizamo, it's not just personal. It's an ideological affront to him. Yeah. That's where it comes in. And that's that's what I'm getting at, where it's not so much a matter of, like, do these people deserve to die or not? It was kind of like an unfolding mystery or driving question about, like, okay, what is this character's reasoning for doing all this? Mm -hmm. the, the factor of, like, deserving or not wasn't really a big thing for me. I guess deserving's maybe the wrong kind of way to jump into it. I, I mm. guess it's like... When you watch a movie where there's a killer or killers, you are in there, like, and you understand what their ideology is and their mindset. Do the people they're actually inflicting it on line up with that, or do they not? Mm -hmm. And sometimes in movies like the Saw franchise, for instance, classic, there are so many people. It's like, why are they there? That doesn't line up with the killer's intentions of it all. And I think for the most part, these people do. Okay, but... so you're talking about like, do they? Do are are they an appropriate victim for yes. the villain that we have? But then you have like the the assistant John Leguizamo, and it's like they do via a very just j just a joke. Mm. With the other ones, he has like soliloquies about like why you're here and like why I have this belief and my history of how I come here. Hence, Margot is the one that rattles him because it's like you don't deserve to be here, but. We're all going to die, by the way. We're all dying. So yeah, that that was also yeah, really interesting point there because when he when he does finally confront our main character and he brings up the whole thing of like, look, you're here, you're gonna die either way. Do you want to die with us or do you want to die with them? Like at first, it kind of felt like a you know attack on her class in a way, mm -hmm. but then as the film unraveled and you start st started to understand his perspective, it actually did seem a lot gentler of a proposition, hmm. weirdly enough. Yes, that's... that's uh, it's like, oh, no, no, I'm not say saying, do you want to be with the rich or do you want to be with the poor? I'm saying, do you want to be with the, you know, the disgusting over there or do you want to be with me, who I envision myself as being the good? Yeah, it's the people who take and the people who give. Yeah, those are his words. And that has a very loaded sentiment towards it, especially in this environment of the rich and the elite, because he is also the rich and the elite. Yeah. Uh, so it feels like hypocrisy. But once you dig deeper into the psychological makeup of, of the servers, of, of the chefs, it's beyond the 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 rich stuff. They They know about being rich and elite, but it's beyond that. It's about... The the destruction of the art form itself mm. and how each one of these uh, guests are a symptom of the, the dying industry. Like, these are the food bros who do it just for content and for money. This is the critic who does it for her own ego and doesn't even know how to eat food, you know, and all that, and is always there to just tear one down. She's the heckler. And... Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought about that when watching this movie. I was like, Jamie Kennedy must have been so happy that her character was 
portrayed that way. <laughs> like, yeah, the, the the Heckler film that we did not too long ago, that's also another one where it was like, oh, these people are rich. Yes. Um, but what else do you want to discuss about your experiences with, with watching the movie? Did you did you enjoy it overall? Did you like it? I did enjoy it overall, yeah. This is another one where as we started talking about it, I realised oh, I actually liked it a little bit more than I thought. Not that I disliked it or anything. It was, well, I, I just kind of thought it was all right, yeah. but, but also very funny. Well, what about it? Did you? What about it on this just initial watch before and before we even get talking about it in these deeper ways? What about it leaves it at that all right phase for for yourself? I think it's just kind of a mix of the things we were talking about, like that lingering notion of like, oh, is it is it kind of unaware of itself? But no, it does seem pretty aware of itself. Yeah. yeah. In what ways did it feel? potentially unaware of itself because I, I i've been thinking about that for a while too because when i saw it i don't know it's just hard to verbalize or even extrapolate out like that that sense of like this is rich people talking about oh have you ever noticed rich people <laughs> yeah I, I guess i guess looking back on it at the end like okay i, I understand now rafe finds his overall you know goal things like that but then there are little things here and there that like I think about it, I'm like, does it quite match? Because if we just describe him as, you know, he's a, you know, world famous chef who uh, used to love his profession, but then, you know, the people that he served has, you know, ruined the job, ruined the art form for him, and now he's exacting his revenge on them. That part I understand, but then I think the fact that he has like a cult of chefs behind him kind of doesn't really match that. I, uh, I, I feel that on a level, but I think it makes sense to the heightened reality of this all, because if you do watch any of these like chef things, uh, programs, the way that they run their kitchens is very, very militaristic and cult-like. It can be, it can be very mm -hmm. intense. And I think it's just the the film having a clever idea of instead of this being like the Wicker Man, in which it's some people like a guy comes onto an island run by you, you know pagans. What happens if we come onto an island and it's run by chefs yeah and the chefs have like this cult-like devotion to the greatest chef of all time and they have like a group psychosis about it because it's not like ray fines came up with all of this you find out like no they as a group came up with how to enact this perfect menu yeah and that's and that whole concept is really complementary to the beginning part of the film because mm. you know all of these rich people who are coming to the island, it's like, oh, yeah, this is a real deal thing. They've got a whole team and they're very strict, you know, strict guidelines about how everything is run and rules that absolutely will not be broken. But then as it goes on, it's kind of like, OK, OK, as we're learning more about Rafe Fiennes' character, the fact that he's basically cult leader. Yeah, that's kind of where the thing comes in. I thought you were going to bring up too that they bring up that we're going to go here, we see all the professionals, but the, the all the guests are thinking it's all Ray finds. That's what matters. When Nicholas Holt starts talking to one of the chefs, Margot points out, I was like, you didn't ask his name, by the way. Mm. And that becomes important because it's like, well, here's this guy, here's his name, here's his mess. And he was like the first, you know, quote unquote, victim that we get of the movie where things you know, flip where things really turn. It's like, oh, we're in trouble now. Mm. Um, and it's about like that weird dehumanization that the industry and the elite have that they bring in and so this group yeah they become faceless but then he brings them into like be like this is this person by the way and this is their idea and like i want you to understand that they did this like it wasn't just me and we still us the audience along with the characters still focus on ray fines hmm. we still focus on him because well he's the head chef yeah i really liked when they brought in the um the the lady that he you know tried to make a move on and how mm. when when she was sitting down with the ladies she was just you know a normal person kind of thing crazy yes but you know talking with them on the same level and not in the cult fashion yeah that, like, oh uh, the, the everyone dying was my idea actually <laughs> I'm real proud of that one mm. 
I enjoyed this a little bit more on the rewatch. I'm not as blown away by it as some other people seem to be. Knowing some of the twists and turns, some of the character reveals and the general tone of it, I think, is improved when revisiting it and rewatching it. Uh, also, there are drawbacks, like you feel the, the pace of the movie a little bit more as well. I like Margot, our main character. I think she's very good. She she has a good level of dismissiveness towards this. And then when things get real, it's not as if she suddenly steps up as like the level-headed rational hero is going to determine and wrangle them all together. No, she's scared shitless too. Mm. And she realizes I'm going to die. <laughs> Uh, and things kind of flip for her more. Like, I know there's some temptation. She does a bunch of stuff. But I think things really turn for her when she finds out that Nicholas Holt knew the whole time what was going to go on. Well, and she, she attacks him. Yeah. And she fucks him up. She's like, fuck you. That was like a great moment. But for me, the the best part of this film was the same as it was when I saw it in the cinema. Nicholas Holt's. He's so good in this movie. The scene. He's so <laughs> fucking amazing in this movie. And if you revisit it from the beginning, you can tell he knows. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows from the start. That's a great part of like complimenting his acting abilities. Of on the on the first watch through, which you went through, mm -hmm. you're unassuming. He's unassuming, and he's like, oh, he seems really calm and collected. Like maybe he's just too nerdy to realize what's going yeah, on. The but... fact that he's doing all the exposition really lended the notion, like, okay, this is kind of the main character. He's flawed. But, you know, he's he's bringing values into it. Like, don't smoke. You won't appreciate the food. And he's the one that comments on most of the guests as they're coming on. Um, and so it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this guy knows his stuff. He's a bit flawed. And his partner's, you know, kind of not into the whole thing. And he's, you know, having to so sort of like babysit, like, don't smoke, you know, hey, be like this. Um, but then, yeah, as the film goes on and, like, he kind of doesn't evolve mm -hmm. or like change his attitude it really he gets worse he gets worse it, re it really I, I really enjoyed watching him and that scene where he's cooking and a lot of it is Ray finds I was like oh I bet I bet this is Ryan's favorite scene my favorite or at least something you love <laughs> it was a great scene and Ray Ray finds whispering in his ear the shit line, I was like, oh, I bet Ryan yeah, loves that one. That's great. <laughs> um, Ray finds whispering into his ear and Nicholas Holt welling up with emotions. That's a meme online. People show that meme and people know what that means <laughs> because it's it's so well executed. Oh, I don't know if, what my favorite scene overall in this is. With Nicholas Holt, I think what's enjoyable about him is as an actor, he's often weirdly cast in like pretty boy roles or like sweet goofy lovable roles they try to cast him in that like in the x-men movies he's beast you know he's beast and it's like oh he's the dorky cute scientist man who becomes the beast you know and it's like okay and he was in the tv show skins and you know he was he was a fucked up little character there but like he was adorable in a weird way and that, i think that's kind of misusing him like he was in the Renfield movie uh where he played Renfield to Nicolas Cage's Dracula and he's supposed to be like the adorable lovey lovable guy oh look at me he was in that warm bodies movie like the the zombie romance film where again he's a weird guy but oh he's adorable he wears a hoodie you know and that type of thing and I just think that's such a misuse of him as an actor because I think he's better playing freaks Ryan loves Him freaks. in Mad Max Fury Road as Nux. He's the war boy. He's the main one, right? He's the main war boy. Yeah. And he's great at that, as that because, well, similar to this, he's playing someone who's who who's wanting to be a part of the cult but isn't good enough. Drastically different characters and results, but very similar foundation point. These people who think that they're good enough to be admired by the cult leader but they're not. And I think he's really good at playing like these warped, twisted characters. Nux is a lovable character. You you grow to care about him. You feel bad for him. In this film, you revel in how much of an amoral prick he is. He, because he's clearly, I don't know if you agree, he's clearly having fun being this amoral prick oh, like it, as an actor. 
it it almost felt artificial, like how invested he was in everything, even when you know shit was hitting the fan. And that's a part of the thing, though. It is artificial. He yeah. knows too much, <laughs> but he knows nothing. I a moment that stuck out to me was when he called her like a child mm. and was really scolding her. Like that was probably one of the scariest moments in the movie for me because he seemed genuinely dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, this is what's underneath all of this character. Well, with Ray Fiennes and the rest of the chefs, we are seeing what's underneath all of them. They are presenting us what's underneath all of it from the very beginning, but it's just so elegantly done. That's the thing. Like, it's so clear that they're insane from the beginning. Mm. Uh, but oh, it's a high class restaurant. It's fine. You know, the story about getting stabbing his dad in the thigh. Well, no, Ryan, as, as one of the men in the film said, it's, it's clearly a bit. Yeah, as the as the critic said, it's theater. It's theater. It's theater. Everyone. Yeah, I was quoting one of the bros. One of the bros. Yeah. yeah, they they. It's clearly a bit. Oh, it's theater. It's acting. And then John Leguizamo, the the actor, is like, no, <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> like when you say John Leguizamo, the actor, like he wasn't acting. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, wasn't his he, character movie star, as the credits say. Yeah, but um, I love Nicholas Holt. I thought his ending is spectacular. <laughs> He just he fucks up. Just as you said, it's an amazing scene. It is it is a top tier scene, but how they wrap up his character <laughs> is is truly glorious. And just how uncaring Margot is at seeing his body hanging there. She's just like well, she, oh, pauses, she pauses for a bit. She gives it a look of like that's what happened and then moves on. <laughs> she feels more guilty about the other people. Hmm. She doesn't feel that guilty about him. He got... Ironically, he's the first one to die of the of the group. Yes, yes, he is, and he's the he's the one that knew. Mm. He chose to do this, and he chose to kill himself. So, <laughs> and he chose very... to bring her along. They all choose to die in the end. That's the thing. They all choose to die. That's the the thing of this movie. Is like in the end, it's a murder, but it's also like a group suicide, mm. which adds to the cult nature to the island itself, mm-hmm. like this group suicide for some weird mantra that <laughs> makes no sense to outsiders, but it made sense to them. I like the added touch of, you know, when he was describing that last course, it's like, this thing is fucking awful, this more, this is how it all ends. <laughs> but it's it's made brilliant by fire, the most primal thing of, <laughs> of and one of the first discoveries of man. <laughs> it's like, okay, you brought it back around. Did you want to talk about any of the other guests in particular? Did you did you have any favorites? Did any any standouts? Any ones that you were drawn to? Because we got Nicholas Holt, of course, and we got Margot. But what about the others? Um, yeah, Nicholas Holt really was the <laughs> the best one. Um, I guess we we do have. I, I like the touch of the tech bros. Mm-hmm. Um. A lot of the guests, you know, they are rich or high class in some way, but they do a really good job of distinguishing, like, the types of characters they are. And they felt, I I like that we had a very, like, juvenile group. It's mm-hmm. also the biggest group that's there. They pretend one of, it's one of their birthdays. They pretend it's one of their birthdays. It was they, funny three hours ago. Yeah. They they keep justifying things, like like what you just said there. Like, oh, it was funny three hours ago. Um, when they get the tortillas that has like all of their illegal dealings, eventually they, they brush off like, we, we can get around this, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll get around. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I loved them trying to escape by just throwing, like one of them grabbing the chair and just smacking it against the, the window and it doesn't work <laughs> and then kicking the window and he's like, ah. and, it, and then and it, he just says, I tried. Yep. And it ends with one of the running jokes of the film where they the chef team just calmly like leads them back to the table. <laughs> that's Man. yeah, that's a really great touch in this film. Like every time something goes really crazy, they the attitudes of the the the, the chefs who are acting as the waiters, you know, just diffuse everything. Like when the guy's finger is cut off and they return the ring, like the the wife still finds it in order to say thank you. I appreciate that it's in the gift bag. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> at the end, and they like list off. It was like and a finger, and Mister Such and Such's finger, and the no, wife. no, no. It was one. It was the guy that they drowned. Oh, like his one, finger. Each one. of his fingers and oh, one yeah, of the so gift of bags. Yeah. And they're like, oh, and the the wife of the guy whose finger has been cut off reacts the most, like, oh, <laughs> not more. I oh, that scene was great where they drowned that guy, and Rafe finds is like quiet now. I'm free. <laughs> like, okay. And we cut to the outside and there's just the air bubbles. Last breath of that guy just coming up to the top. Yeah, we never get a close look at that guy. No, we don't. Uh, outside of photos in Ray Fine's uh, house because there's photos oh, yeah, with him. Oh, yeah, fair point, fair point. I loved John Leguizamo in this. I don't know if you're a fan of his character or his performance. I love John Leguizamo in general. I think he's... An underrated actor. He he's so good, but I love him in this movie because although he's like the elite movie, like he's the movie star, the fading movie star, and he's like a whore. You know, he's always name dropping and doing all of this and lying and everything like that. I felt the most sympathetic towards him, weirdly enough, out of the rich elite people because he he knew what he was. And he felt like the most like genuine, even though he is. His character is based around his insecurity, and it's not something that he really hides. No, that's exactly it. And I love how he's like, oh, the movie wasn't well received, but you know what? It was a fun shoot. Like he's like, you know, I'm not. He's not upset when people like that movie. I, I like that. Like you know, he, he's he's both humble and extremely egotistical. And I thought his portrayal of that was out of all of the rich elite characters. I thought he felt the most like a real person and less of a caricature, even though when you list off the things he says and does could easily be summed up as like, well, that's a obvious like cartoon of like rich actor, man. Like he even has the scarf and everything, but (laughs) I think Leguizamo just carries himself in a way that feels authentic. Even when, um, you know when the quote unquote coast guard comes in like john like that's john leguizamo's like scene to mm. you know kind of shine and stand out um the way he talks to that fan even though there's all this pressure is like oh yeah this this kind of feels like you know you've just met a celebrity and he they're being friendly now like if you know who that person really is they're not showing their true self they're showing like oh you're your i'm your idol i'll behave that way and nice and casual there was even a great comedic because John Leguizamo is a great comedic actor. I was think I know he does dramas, but I always think of him as a comedic actor. Uh, the the comedic line delivery of when his assistant asks him how did like how did he go with like trying to escape when they made all the men try to escape. He plays it so straight, like it's a clear joke, but like Leguizamo plays it so straight when he's just like. Oh yeah, it went great actually. I, I managed to escape and get off the island, and I got went back, got help, and, it, and she's just in there like, uh huh. It, it was just a very that was like a standout moment for me. I, I I forgot that moment from the initial watch, but when I saw it come up again, I'm like, oh right, this. Like, it was so, a good little snarky moment. It was a good, yeah. but again, he didn't play it like I'm being so snarky, you fucking mm. idiot. He played it like, oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I did escape actually. And it's just, like, <laughs> but it's his body language, as like as he's saying, he's just slouching more and more, and becoming like. I I'm live here now. Like, his body was basically like, I live in this place now, I guess. He's resigned to the fact that he he didn't make it, but his his line delivery of it was was really straight edge. Um I was just thinking now, we've done a couple of films on the podcast where and most of the time it's you revealing it to me, like, oh yeah, this film was, you know, based on a play or mm-hmm. because, you know, the 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 setting of the film is a space that you come very intimate with. Uh, and it's this is one where, yeah, you think back on the film and everyone is so clearly defined that you can remember where everyone is sitting in this yeah. room. And it's like, oh, yeah, John Leguizamo in that corner of his. And it's like, yeah, I, I remember exactly where he is. I don't know the behind the scenes too much outside of uh, the director or writer, director and writer uh, went to a restaurant that this is based on and realized halfway through the meal that they're trapped there. Like if something went wrong, there was no way to get off the island unless the staff so deemed it. Mm. And that was like scary to them. And they went, wouldn't that be a great idea for a movie? And it was a great idea for a movie. Like it's a really unique idea for a movie. Like when I, that's something I didn't know. I knew it was like rich elite 
evil chefs, but I didn't know the the isolationist quality to it and the cult mentality of it. I I really I thought this was going to be a cannibal movie as well. Like I really did. I thought it was going to be like the they're serving up people, they're going to cook people, but they're doing it in a very like, you know, nouveau riche type way. Like yeah. oh look at us, aren't we being fancy? But no, and that being on an island, and it just reminds me of stuff like The Wicker Man, and I was just, that was a delightful surprise of of this film. I think it really works in its favor that you're inside this gorgeous restaurant, but on the outside, it's just a black void, just nothing but the mm. sea. It's like that time you got trapped in that room with the computer. Yes. That time... Yeah, well, you're like taking a test or something, and oh, they come yes. the door. <laughs> right. So now you're bringing my real life. So yeah, that's, this that's time, why you like the film because you, like you, you relate got, to it. There was one time I got for an interview. They they asked me to do something on a computer, and uh, they they closed the door and it got locked, and I was locked in there in a room by myself, and no one came to get me for a very long time. And because they're like, well, he can leave. I couldn't leave. That's exactly it. It was a room filled with Apple computers, Macs. And I was like, oh, I'm in a nightmare, nightmare. It's a real gilded cage. All a these expensive cage. computers, but you can't leave. And I can't call for help. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that. Yeah, yeah, what an interesting point of view. I like the critic. I liked her. I like the little touch of uh, She Smokes, hmm. which, is, which is neat because Nicholas Holt has the whole thing of like, if you're a real food professional, you wouldn't smoke. She does. Mm. Uh, and I like the touch, too, of um, she ends up being one of the more important ones uh, because of, you know, her, I guess, kill list, in a way, mm. of, of restaurants. Um, and there's a very long portion of this film where she thinks that it's all an act for her sake. <laughs> Or it's revenge against her specifically. Because he, she, also important, she made him. Mm. She's the one that gave him the review that launched his career. And there's he still has the art, he still has the review framed and, and, and things like that. Yeah, she, she was played well. I thought she was very funny. I liked her and her... Um, what was he? He was like a like publicist, manager, or manager something? publicist guy. Yes, man. For the, man. The yes, man. I thought he was very good. Mm. I, I found him like when he had to run away, he was like, Oh sorry, darling. And got and he sprints away very prissily. And he's the last one to be found and he gets a little reward for it. Yeah. I, I like that touch too, because um when they said like, okay, the men now have a forty five second head start to run away and Ray Fines was gonna explain everything, but the tech bro just ran. One of the tech bros ran. He's like, okay, never mind, just start now. And you think like, oh shit, this is they're actually gonna like hunt them down. But no, it was literally just you know a chance to escape. <laughs> and there's a reward at the end for the last one that gets caught. And that Nicholas Holt doesn't even try until he's pointed <laughs> out to do it, and he's like, oh, it doesn't Ray apply to me. <laughs> Ray Fines like, do it, come on. <laughs> um, one of my favorite Ray Fines moments was, and it gets brought up as a point of contention for Ray Fines with Nicholas Holt, was when he's like, any questions? And Nicholas Holt's like, yes, am I, am I detecting a scent of this? And just, yes. Yes, that's what it is. Like, Nicholas Holt asks, is like, is this a scent of this in the food or drink or whatever? And just, Ray Fines deadpan, yes. Yes, it is. And then he brings it up later. It's like, you knew that. No, exactly that. And he's like, you're the problem. <laughs> You're the problem. You you make our art form weaker. Mm. The guy who got his finger cut off really wishes he knew things. Oh, man. That was so funny where he's like, I'm going to handle this. Which hand? <laughs> we haven't talked about her right I mean, enough. Like We talked about that actress, but that character, she's... Elsa, was it? Yeah, she's probably like the stand, like, standout funniest person in the movie. Like She, she because she is so, like, just neutral hmm. the whole time and creepy because of that and she's got like that you know that smile all the time it's always like upbeat but you can tell it's like faux <laughs> did you have a favorite moment with her no you really really know when you say that she was a standout yeah um i guess you could tell you know throughout the film that like something's wrong here but like her little line to the tech bro who was, was like you'll get less than you desire and more than you deserve or something. Yeah, and she whispers it with a smile. And then she just leans back and it's like, pleasure serving you boys, and then walks away. I liked when they asked her in the smokehouse if you served that meetup a couple of days early, 
what would happen? Would all chaos break out? And she like explains how it mm. would in a very like upbeat, jovial manner without taking a breath. There's just like this one long delivery of this horrific series of events that would happen, and then she just moves on. Yeah, and the, and in a different film, like the exact you know things she said would be like a like oh down to earth kind of thing, but like she makes it just a little bit unsettling. Or it's a Chekhov's gun. Oh, they set that up. That will come in late. It doesn't come in late. That doesn't come in later. Like that's just like a thing. It's like that's the way they could kill you by the way yeah they, they i did read online that some of her lines uh foreshadow things like yeah one of the bros say something like we'll have you shut down and she just you know smiles and says like oh that's that's not a factor that we really care about mm-hmm. because you know they're gonna burn it all down at the end anyway very true i want to discuss margo if you don't mind we mm-hmm. we've said a bunch about her as a good main character but what do you feel about the reveals uh, behind her and why she is the one that's allowed to live in the end and how she manages to find a way to get at Ray Fine's character? No, she's very complimentary to her antagonist because um, he has that line, it's like, I can, you know, I can detect someone in the service industry. Um, and as you learn his point of view, you understand why he gravitates towards her. And... Her reveal of not knowing Nicholas Holt before this and that she's not a friend, she's not a girlfriend, she's an escort that he's hired only because, well, they don't allow one, so I had Mm. to let you come and, well, you're lower then, so you're good enough to sacrifice Mm. to die. And that gets into Ray Fine's point even more about, like, the service industry and about, like, she yeah she's a she's an escort and she's had to do stuff like like when she had to describe some of her job and Ray finds like oh no no I don't mind like I've got a vivid picture I don't need all the details of it is like you know all that or like oh very unique and she's like not really <laughs> and he's like oh okay then you know like I, I like that outside of just being like a neat reveal it actually gets into the thrust of the movie of like why is she allowed to live other than she's innocent because. She wasn't invited on the list. There's a version of this in which she gets to live because, well, she wasn't targeted at the start anyway. Mm. And Ray Fiennes may, you know, there's a version of this where Ray Fiennes, throughout all of his psychosis, may see a glimmer of, like, normalcy and be like, no, this is an innocent who doesn't deserve... No, he factors it in to his insanity of, like, why she should live. It's like, she meets all of these reasonings in my in my group psychosis of why she's allowed to get away, and she plays to that. Like that's the thing, she she figures out his backstory and like what made him happy, and she just plays to that. She plays him like she is an escort mm. through and through because that's her job. Yeah, she and- had to play to Nicholas Holtz. She has to play to Ray Fiennes, and yeah, she wins. She gets to go out because she's giving him a service yeah and it also has that other layer of um you know and there's you know recurring jokes throughout the film about this like oh if you guys fought a little bit harder you might have actually been able to get away her the thing that she does to you know get away is to stand up to him in the right way yes and she issues a you know ultimatum in a way yeah a formal complaint and you know gets her way and ray finds respects it she she operates via the fact that there are no rules because the whole thing is there's rules. Mm. Nicholas Holt is like you can't send food back in an establishment like that. It goes against the rules, and she well that fuck the rules, <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And that's kind of what helps her out is they're all complicit in this in their own deaths because to go to that social stuff the social etiquette. Mm. None of them are willing to buck the social etiquette enough to escape. They're not willing to risk their own lives enough. They're not really willing to lose face enough to do that. And it costs them their lives. And like at the end, the, the wife of the, the guy that Margot was an escort for gives her like the, the little wave away, like go, just go like, we've accepted what's happening here. Just go. You don't have to be here. Mm. And the fact that that person is the one that gives her the, the okay means a lot because Margot has like a you know history with this with these people. And that's good. But no, I, I think that works even better on a rewatch of like 
how Marga, who Marga is, what she is about, and like how she views the world improves when you go back. Because again, to praise the acting, you see that these two characters and the performers portraying them are doing two performances at the same time in a weird way. It's like they're performing a version of this of these characters that are like you know, the the naive person who's in over their head and the guy who's a dork who's really getting at the thing, but really, she's the world-weary one who's been around and knows things, and he's a psychopath. Uh, and I think it really works well uh, on, on the revisit. Um, did you love when she did do the whole, I'm sending it back and I want a burger, like a real <laughs> burger? Yeah. Not one of these fancy deconstructionist <laughs> burgers. Yeah, like I said, she she worked out the exact way to get at him. And you could see even Ray Fiennes, like, being a little bit nervous. It's like, oh, I have to do this the proper way. You have a complaint? Well, what is it? But he's excited. <laughs> he's excited as well, though. Yeah. Like, when she when she says, I want a burger, like a real burger, because that's what made him happy. Yeah, but she even before that, like, she had all these, like, little biting lines, like, you know, the worst part? I'm still hungry. It's like... <gasps> You're still hungry? How, how hungry? starving <laughs> and it's it's hilarious because throughout the movie he was like it wounds me that you don't eat but then at the end she's like i'm starving you haven't fed me he's like oh how could that be <laughs> but he's so in rhythm for what she needs like what she's doing that he's not doing the whole like well it's because you haven't eaten like if it was nicholas holt hmm. he would have been like well you haven't eaten the food yeah he, he 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 bit back earlier on where it was like you said not to eat it's like you that's you not what i meant and you know and you know that <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was more of her and Ray Fiennes back and forth thing. Like, there's a good amount, but I thought they were, like, a wonderful duo of, like, mm. two strange people. Because, like, uh, like uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, the actress, is, like, she's she's beautiful, but she's weird looking. Like, that's a part of it. Like, she's talked about, like, the far apart eyes that she has. And Ray Fiennes... You know, he's a dashing gentleman. Like he's a very, you know, he's a very, but he's weird looking. Hence, he played Voldemort with very mm. little makeup needed. But you know, I mean, like he's weird. They're both strange looking people, and I think they stand out in this room full of like gorgeous looking people. They kind of, they kind of stand out in this room of like normal, gorgeous, socialite looking people. And then, then there's these two bickering back and forth at each other about like what it is to be a service worker. But it's like they're both prim proper gorgeous people who are also just a little bit strange as well Mm. that's always fun when the you know two opposing forces are like the same at the core yeah it is uh you said before that you haven't read too much of the trivia i I read through a little bit of it um there was a couple of interesting things about john leguizamo's character Mm. um there was an actor that uh was originally gonna play that character and it was gonna be basically them playing themselves, but as, like, you know, a sort of fictionalized version. Because I was trying to apply that to John Leguizamo, and I just I just didn't think it mapped for what I know of him as an actor. No, no, no. And there was a trivia point about which actor he was inspired by, but, you know, these are two separate things. So the person that they were originally going to get was apparently Daniel Radcliffe <laughs> playing a version of himself. So, you know, you have the irony of, you know, the villain is Ray Fiennes. <laughs> yes. That would be amazing. Yeah. And the other one was uh, the inspiration that John Leguizamo brought to uh, the character. So in the late 90s, he did a film with, I can I forget the title, but he did a film with Steven Seagal. Oh, yes. And apparently he hated... I know of, I know of his stories of Steven Seagal. <laughs> yeah. I've heard, he knocked Steven Seagal out, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I, I didn't hear that. But basically, um, he really doesn't like Steven Seagal, and he brought those elements to the character he was playing. I will just say this. We will do it after, but if people have not listened to John Leguizamo talk about working with Steven Seagal, you're doing yourself a disservice. It is amazing <laughs> storytelling. Oh, wow. He's so he's so funny when he tells stories about how much he fucking hates Steven Seagal. That's amazing, yeah? I wonder what the Daniel Radcliffe version of this is like, because now I, I, mean, I have an even harder time connecting because... This feels like it's supposed to be like an old, washed-up actor rather than... Mm. W- what would be the Daniel Radcliffe version of this? Where he's like a young actor who, if anything, it was like... The thing about Daniel Radcliffe is he's the young actor who had it all and he decided that he would rather be a character actor. Like, that's an interesting... Like, 
actor journey wise is interesting. I wonder how it would have worked outside of like the meta fun of having Harry Potter and you know Harry Potter and Voldemort face off again. But uh, yeah, it's I don't know how that would have. I'm interested. Mm. I, I'm interested, but I don't know how it would have been. Um, I would have loved to see Elijah Wood in this movie. He would have been fun. Yeah, he always plays weirdos. Uh, but oh yeah, apparently there was a true point that um, and I forget the name of it, but like every year there's that uh Hollywood list of like the best rejected scripts yeah, the black, or something. The blacklist. Yeah, the yeah. blacklist. And apparently the menu was like the 2019 version of that. So a lot of people know about like a lot of the original ideas for mm. the film based on that. And I think that's where the Daniel Radcliffe thing came oh, from. Oh, interesting. I wonder if this was a this must have been you mentioned about if this is a play, like you know, talk about like behind the scenes and like, you know, the confined location. This must have been a, a COVID movie as well, right? Just by looking at when things well, were made and COVID filmed. gets mentioned in the film. Yeah. Oh, yes, it does, doesn't it? Yes. But when yeah, they filmed it... was it, when, Yeah, it was when the guy was being drowned. It's like, he kept you open through COVID. That's right. I wonder if that factors into... Like, that must have factored into the production, like, how it's all staged and, like, way it's done. But it still works. It's still, still yeah. very natural. There was, there was also another trivia point about how, you know, because the shoots were so long, like, all of the actors, like, grew really close to each mm -hmm. other. So, yeah, that kind of lends itself to that I, idea as well. I, I think this works great as, like, a like a common commentary comedy movie. I didn't find it scary or horrific all that much. I think that's there on the base premise of it all. But uh, like I said, I, you know, as as a this time of year movie, I do think it works as like a more avant garde pick. But uh, you know, for for the horror or for the, the things like this, it, it definitely has a a bit more of the leaning towards the comedic and when amanda suggested previously bodies 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 part of my frustration with that movie was it did feel separate from its genres like here's the sections of the movie where we walk around in the dark and scream and now it's a comedy and i don't think this movie suffered from that at all i think it blends together but i think it's more of a laugh affair than actually being scary in any yeah, way. Like this Ray Fiennes can be a scary actor, of course, but he's funny. Yeah, this, he's... this reminds me a little bit more of like the the South Korean thrillers that we've done on the podcast. Oh yeah, where like oh they're not necessarily scary, but you know they're they're gripping. Kind yeah, of thing. Ray Fiennes. You, we've talked about him throughout, but let's just you know unless there's more you want to talk about, I, I kind of want to end on him as a discussion point. Oh, go for it. Yeah. What do you feel about him as an actor overall? You've seen him through your life in, in different, very different roles as well, like very different to one another yeah, roles. Yeah, I, I, I want to see more from him. He's not one that was completely on my radar. Like we, um, you know, to go behind the scenes a little bit, we're recording this literally the day after the last episode. And you mentioned at the end, I don't know if it was in the recording or as I was leaving, that, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the menu, Ray Fiennes is in it. And somehow I'd forgotten that by the time I started the film. Um, so yeah, just not on my radar. I know that my mum loves Ray Fiennes. Yes. Yeah. He's in just, you know, for your mum's ear, he's in just classic films. I mean, he's in Schindler's List, of course, as like the despicable Nazi. Yeah. You, you mentioned it earlier though. Um, Grand Budapest Hotel. Like I, when I think of that film, I, there's a lot of people in it, but I just keep thinking back on him. It relies on him. He was great in that. <laughs> he's so funny too. He's very, yeah, but that's the thing. Throughout just ones we've talked about here on the pod, like literally on the pod or movies we've raised through our podcasting, just like you and I talk about it, like he is a diverse actor. He, like the Avengers, for instance, it's an action movie. You know, he has to be the James Bond type, you know, but it's also funny and charismatic, but you know, it's him doing flips and kicks and running around and being an elegant badass. And then you get the Harry Potter films, of course, where he's playing like an you know, a demonic creature and he's all, you know, people make fun of that performance. I Do you think, honestly, his performance as Voldemort is good? Um, He's mostly in the later ones and those are the ones I haven't rewatched as much. Uh, I was, I'm sure it was fine. I know there's one line in the very last film that I quote a lot. Draco. <laughs> I remember it he is, says that. It is when he, it's the scene where he's hugging him because I remember there was a video around the time I was in the last years of high school going around where 
in, at the end, like later on in that last film, like he hugs Draco Malfoy, um, and then he's like, "Ah, Draco, well done, well done, Draco." And in this edited video, it's like he keeps going back for more, and it's just this awkwardly long, you know, bad, you know more it's already hugs. awkward. <laughs> yeah, just the well done, well done. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good performance. I don't know. I, I it's a it's a memorable performance. Okay, like we'll, we'll have to do all the Harry Potter films. We then. have to. Do, we've done one. We've done like the one where he's like got the least presence. Like he's not in it at all. Is Rafe even? Is Rafe in that one? I don't even. I think it's I don't Goblet even, of Fire. He's introduced. Yeah, I don't even think he's in the first three. No, Rafe is in. I think it's Goblet of Fire. He comes in because yeah, that's when he gets then, resurrected. We have CGI face and Tom Riddle. Sorry, and, spoilers for Harry Potter uh, and the Harry Goblet Potter. of Fire. But he's just, he can do comedy, like, uh, Hail Caesar, hilarious. Mm. And did you, I can't remember, did you see Hail Caesar in the end? Uh, the Coen Brothers? Yeah, I saw that in cinema. Yeah, he has the, the classic, would that it work? Oh, yes! Yes, it's bringing oh, you back. fucking amazing in that. Yeah, everyone's amazing in that, but, like, he's a guy that would was... Would that it were so simple? Well, yes, would that it were. And he's a guy that will play rough and tumble like in talking about in Bruges earlier he's Harry in in Bruges where he's like got a cockney accent he's got the famous scene where he like smashes the telephone and he's just like his wife comes in and is like Harry it's a fucking inanimate object and he screams at the top of his lungs you're a fucking inanimate object <laughs> and then hard cut to him walking in very polite telling her I'm so sorry you're not a fucking inanimate object just, <laughs> he could be very funny but then he's the Nazi from Schindler's List you know, like he, he is a dramatic actor. Like I think of him as a dramatic actor, but you go through his career and he, and he's willing to be silly. He's willing to be funny. He's willing to be, you know, charming or lowbrow or whatever it is, or, or like psychopathic killers, like in Red Dragon. Like you go through his career and it's like Prince of Egypt, of course, doing great voice works as, you know, the baddie in that one, you know, who you feel for in, in that too. But in this I think this is like the perfect culmination of his career in a lot of ways because he doesn't play it like it's funny in this movie. He never plays it like it's funny, but you can tell he's having the time of his life with this. And I, I think it's like a brilliant combination of like all the type of roles he plays where he can be scary in this. He can be warm and charming, but he's also cold and inhuman, but he's polite, but he's also rude. Oh yeah, that, I brought it up already. But the scene where Nick Holding is that his name? Nicholas Holt. Nicholas Holt. Um, Nick Holding. <laughs> Nick Holding is uh, you know making the food, and he every time he comes up with a you know different ingredient or something, Ray finds has a really good like comeback line. It's like, oh, I, all my years I have never even thought about this before. And when he's stuttering with like the shh shh shh, and he comes off the shout, he's like, "Shit! Do you want? Do you want some shit?" <laughs> so funny. He's so great. Uh, you donkey. <laughs> he does it. Gordon Ramsay's. It's uh, a reference. Gordon Ramsay. But uh, that's the menu. I like it overall. It's not my favorite uh, film ever. I think it's. My sister loves this movie, by the way. And whenever I say, like, it's okay, my sister's like, well, what more do you need from it? And I'm like, that's a great question. Yeah. What more does this movie need? I think it's just a, a preference thing. Like, on an individualistic level, I find this movie pretty good. But I won't deny that this is probably the best version or, like, a, probably one of the best versions of this idea brought to life. Like, they bring in these actors. They have great direction here. The music's good. It's in very subtle it's not that intrusive the comedy it never feels like it's going overboard at any points yeah i don't know i think it's just on, on, on my own individual level i was like eh, it's, it's okay it's a really apt question alana's asked yeah it's because i i walked into this being like this was a good film i liked it it was very funny but i didn't love it and i didn't quite know why and definitely like you know within like 20 minutes of this recording like i was appreciating it more and more and i now I'm a bit more enthusiastic about it, but I still don't quite, yeah, hold it to the highest degree. No, but maybe. it's a really good film, and I do recommend it. I do recommend it wholeheartedly. I I think people will get something out of this, hmm. uh, and the structure of it's just very pleasing. The menu being the structure of the story is just it's very pleasing. Like when they make it into jokes as well, that's great. Like talking about Nicholas Holt. When his one comes up on the menu of like his shitty dish and like tells you like how he fucked it up 
Yeah, uh, what that was, was it, Tyler's bullshit or something? Tyler's bullshit, and it tells you, like, chop, like, you know, inedible, <laughs> you know, this undercooked pork, all of that. It was, it was so and, awesome. And Ray finds has another fake outline where it's like, this is amazingly bad, or bad, something like that. <laughs> this is bad. Okay, so you are the one that has a recommendation up next mm -hmm. for our spooky month, and it is your Hollywood pick, your American pick, because Bartek... One time goes Hollywood and one time goes foreign. And last time with you, it was a foreign movie. You gave us the Japanese film Gozu. Gozu wasn't American? I'm shocked to tell you there <laughs> was an American in it. There was. She she did perfect Japanese. So what is your film? Um, I don't think this film's liked very much. Oh, no. Um, but I've always been curious to check it out. And you literally mentioned it last episode. Oh, no. And uh, it stars an actress who was in that last episode. So we'll see if we like her a bit more. Oh, no. Um, it's uh, the 1981 film Shock Treatment. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. No. So, you see, oh, I, brought God, up, no. I brought up for the Gozu episode that, oh, I, I, there was a oh. Japanese musical <laughs> comedy that I could have picked, a horror comedy but then I chose a film that wasn't, so I'm making up for it now by picking a <sighs> horror comedy musical. Now, I want to ask this, because you can be a very naughty boy when I ask this. Oh, I draw so, on crayon walls all so the So, he draws and pisses on the floor. <laughs> we always have to mop up after bars. I draw on crayon walls. Walls <laughs> made of crayons. Nicholas Holding is right there, with, <laughs> with your with crayon my, in hand. With my delinquent buddy, Nicholas Holding. <laughs> Nicholas Holding my crayon is his name, actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> you know what? I ask this question. So, for those who aren't aware, Shock Treatment is a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. Very strange sequel, but it is a sequel. No one talks about that. No one ever brings up that there's a sequel. Uh, spoiler alert: Frankenfurt is not in it, and that's usually the point of contention. But I have to ask: Are we just watching Shock Treatment on its own? Or are we also going to watch Rocky Horror as well? Because I ask, because sometimes you do this thing where you're like, we'll do this, and then you'll be like, I also watch the thing, the other thing. And I'm like, well, where, where do we want to meet I'm, on equal footing with the discussion? Because I'm just intending on shock treatment. Okay, I just want to ask, because you know sometimes we do these, and then it becomes a conversation about like compare, contrast, and sequel, or whatever. Like with you know when we did Desperado, you went and watched El Mariachi, and then or when we did Story of Ricky, and he was like, "We're going to watch this version." And then you watch the other version. I'm like, "Well, we're having separate no, no, conversations." I, I, no, I, watched, I just want to. We make watched the sure... same version with Story of Ricky. I just had subtitles on, which were uh, for the other. And version. then, and but then you were like asking questions about that. I'm like, I didn't watch that, and you're like, "But Ryan, I did." I'm like, "Oh, well, I don't know," but I just want to double check because shock treatment is often regarded poorly because it's a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I wanted to know if we wanted to meet it on that level or talk about it as its own film. I mean, it'll be hard because I've grown up with Rocky Horror, but we'll watch it on its own for those out there just wanting to give you, the, the listening people, a frame of reference as well. So Shock Treatment, the follow-up starring uh, only three of the actors from the previous film come back and the rest are new folks. And I've seen Rocky Horror once or twice yeah and i don't remember too much from it i mean i remember most a lot of it but not a lot of the finer details so that's all right we'll see if i even recognize anyone <laughs> well i think you will but that is it thank you all so much for listening we shall be back with our discussion of shock treatment another entry of horror spooky month musical movies so for, they, for the year of the musical for the year of the musicals we found two separate ones Amazing. Ooh. And you had the potential of a third. So with your Japanese pick, you could have given us a third one. Yeah, I could. Oh, I could have given us the first one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm just listing like in terms of like, we could have had three. Well, so. Ryan, we can still have three because the last one for the month will be your pick. Oh, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll scour the earth and you'll, I'll come you'll, back. You'll pick the Mikkei film. <laughs> oh, 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 no. But thank you all so much for listening out there. We shall be back. In the meantime, you can message us at our email address, which is spitandpolished at gmail.com to let us know your thoughts, opinions, and, and any questions you have for us. And we take film recommendations. It's not just Amanda 
and Stefan, who are not in a relationship. They're just friends. They're just friends. They went to primary school together. They went to primary... That, yeah, that's exactly it. People yeah. who've been to primary school together never got into relationships. Never. No. Not happened once. Not they, one time. They, not they also went to primary school with other guests we've had, Reese and Malloy. Who are a couple, actually. Mm. Um, weirdly enough. But that's that's incidental to everything else. But, um, oh, I take it back. Reese would never date Malloy. Never. Mm. Never, ever. That guy doesn't even know how to spell his own last name. I'm sure he's learned by now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's picked it up. He's been it's to been... primary school for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the uh, other three left him behind. The other three. He's still there to this day. <laughs> he's he's nearly finished primary school, that Malloy. But uh, we have our social medias of Facebook and Twitter. You can contact us there, follow us there. But yeah, let us know if you have any film recommendations. Hit us up with some. We add it to the list. And we do get around to them eventually. We've had we've had one or two comments be like, hey, cover this movie. And then we're like, yeah, we add it to the list. And like, how come you haven't covered it yet? It's like, well, we've got a list. Yeah, we had we had plans we through them. We had plans for the listening people choice of spooky month. It's like a film that's been on the list for like four years. That but... your mum recommended. Yeah, that's true. And we were meaning to get around to it, but yeah, things happen. We'll hopefully get around to it soon. Oh yes. Um, but no promises. No promises for Bartek's mother. I'm so sorry, Bartek's mum. It's a good film, too. I've seen well, it. Please let us know why you love Rafe Fiennes. Uh, I'm sure you'll let us know why you love Rafe Fiennes so much. Fun fact, when we did The Avengers, you and Lauren told me how to say his name right. Yeah. And I went home and told mom, like, hey, you know his name's actually Rafe? Yeah. It's a thing. It's a thing. Uh, it's just like regional pronunciation thing but when you read it you're like it's ralph yeah it's ralph ralph but uh i've watched the simpson i've watched one simpson the one simpson which one lisa because she's in this, a lot of things with ralph <laughs> that's true that's true there that is she is the one that teamed up they're in the same grade yeah same class same yeah. class miss hoover's class Thank you for reminding me about ralph wiggum no i'm reminding you about lisa no i i, I always remember lisa <laughs> Oh, you're thinking of Rafe remember. Wiggum. Yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine Rafe Fiennes doing the voice of Chief Wiggum? And what accent? He's trying to do the Chief's <laughs> accent, but it's like how his accent is in this, where it flickers in and out. And he's trying to do like the kind of squeaky way he speaks, but also goes in and out of that and Voldemort. Well done, Rafe. Would Voldemort have been better if voiced by Ralph Wiggum? By 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 Nancy Cartwright? Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, Na- Nancy Mort. <laughs> Sounds like a disease. <laughs> Nancy Mort. Well, well, I mean, she's well, a Scientologist, well, so she may as well be a disease. Well, Mort is like death, right? Sure. That's why he's called Mor- Voldemort. Mortis. Mortician. Morticia. Morticia. <laughs> <laughs>